I'm Dr. Nathaniel Chin, and you're listening to Dementia Matters, a podcast about Alzheimer's disease. Dementia Matters is a production of the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Our goal is to educate listeners on the latest news in Alzheimer's disease research and caregiver strategies. Thanks for joining us. My guest today on Dementia Matters is Professor Nicole Werner from the University of Wisconsin-Madison College of Engineering. Dr. Werner's lab uses human factors engineering to improve technologies, systems, and processes that support patients with complex health needs. Today, we're going to talk about an app that supports dementia caregivers, as well as other technology tools that can support people with dementia and the people who care for them. Dr. Werner, welcome to Dementia Matters. Thanks so much for having me. Now, I'm excited to learn about the work you are doing to support people with Alzheimer's disease and other causes of dementia. But first, I'm hoping you can give our listeners a brief explanation of the field of human factors engineering. Yes, of course. I'm happy to. This is the plight of the human factors engineer that we always have to explain what we do because most people have never heard of us. (laughs) Um, But human factors is is a science. It blends the fields of psychology and engineering. And what we seek to do is design systems that fit people based on their inherent capabilities and limitations and in the context in which they interact with systems. So basically, we're interested in designing systems that fit people in their individual contexts and what they do, rather than designing a system and expecting people to use it. Well, that's wonderful. And it's two really important individual fields. And now you've combined it in a way that it sounds like synergistically helps people. I believe so. Um, we have a lot of theories, principles, and methods that we use to accomplish the goal that I just described. But I think a really important key feature um, that pertains especially to the app and the things that we'll be talking about today, like technology design, is user-centered design. Now, according to the Alzheimer's Association, more than 16 million family members and friends provide over 18 billion hours of unpaid care to people with Alzheimer's disease and other causes of dementia every year. So caregivers are often having little to no training or support and are sometimes performing complex caregiver duties. So at the same time, they're experiencing stress and perhaps their own health concerns. Now, your lab is developing a tool to support these people. So if you could tell us about the challenges informal caregivers are facing and how you hope you can work to help them. Yeah, thanks. I, I have to say that when I, when I think about the challenges informal caregivers face, they're so immense. And so in a lot of ways, we have to pick something because there's so many challenges. So we try to pick something that we think we can help. And when I was a still a graduate student, I uh, volunteered to work on a project um, that was a randomized controlled trial of an intervention for caregivers. And I went to a caregiver's home, and it was my first time um, as kind of an engineer going into a, a home of a person who was providing health care in a home. And uh, so I kind of was naive. And this woman who was caring for her husband with, uh, with dementia um, started, just started crying when I came in. She had no one to talk to, and she felt really isolated, and she felt overwhelmed. And ever since then, I have just felt really passionate and dedicated to trying to help her and the people that are like her. And so when I started my faculty position at UW, I set out to design this app. And uh, the purpose of this app was to try and uh, take advantage of the fact that there's lots of other people that might want to help these, um, what are called primary caregivers, the person providing most of the care, um, but they don't really have an easy way to do that right now. And typically caregivers don't want to or don't feel comfortable asking for help. So the app that we're designing is set out to try and connect caregivers around the care of an individual person with dementia in the sense of harnessing that power of the caregiving network so that we can relieve some of the burden on the primary caregiver and and make their lives a little bit easier and also support them in providing the care that they really want to give. You know, I'm struck by some of the things that you you said, because frankly, you're so right that this is a extremely complex 
disease and process, and there are so many layers to this, and there isn't one thing that can take care of all of it. And so to have a very specific focus makes a lot of sense if we're truly going to have an impact. And then with your story of you know caregivers feeling isolated and being hesitant to ask for help, it seems like your app has a very, what sounds like straightforward, I know it's not, but it's <laughs> a very clear mission. Uh, which is so needed when it comes to helping other people. And and so one, I want to say thank you for working on it, because I think this is a huge need. But then two, you know, when looking at this app, you know, what are some of these user-friendly features that are going to make it useful, that are going to make it um, applicable to caregivers? Yeah, I guess uh, I want to start out by just saying that, um, as I mentioned earlier, because I'm a human factors engineer, I use user-centered design to design this app. And user-centered design is talked about a lot, but basically it's a gold standard process for designing products. And you design the products by involving the end user or the representatives of the end user population. And we do that to better address the user needs. So what we're trying to do is really understand user, the, user, the end user population so that we can design something that really fits their needs. And so that's what we set out to do. Um, we applied that process. And what I think is really important for this particular population is that user-centered design um, can often be misunderstood as what people like. You know, oh, do you like the color blue or do you like the color green? But really, it's not about that. It's about understanding the interaction between the user behavior, like how they actually behave in life, what they do, their actual needs and how that all plays out within the context of um, where they're providing care, for example. And then transforming all those insights into design recommendations or design requirements. So it seems to me a lot of work goes in before the app even (laughs) materializes. There's a lot of understanding and evaluating and observing um, beforehand. That's right. We spend a lot of time with the end users. And so interviewing them, Um, bringing design ideas to them and really digging deep to find out how can we can really meet this need and design something that is not only going to meet their need, but also, um, and this speaks to your (laughs) original question, which I skirted around a little bit, um, but which also makes it more user-friendly, which is that we can provide simplicity and we can provide um, a reduction in workload for using the app versus increasing the work that they have to do, right? Because they're already very overburdened. So some of the kind of more um, user-friendly aspects of the app are that we, we've we tried to design it using caregivers' own nomenclature or the language that they use around care caregiving. And um, some other features are the ability to distribute caregiving activities and easily communicate with the rest of the caregiving network. So we have a uh, to-do list and and calendar function that allow the caregiving network to share tasks among each other and to figure out easily when someone might be more overloaded and need someone else to take on some of the tasks. And then we have a dashboard that has collaborative messaging so that the whole caregiving network can communicate and have situation awareness about what's happening at the present time. You know, I'm struck by one of the first things you said there, which is that using the caregiver's own language or nomenclature, you know, why is it so important to be careful about the words that caregivers use and to have that kind of structure implemented in the app? You know, this came up a lot. We interviewed 30 caregivers when we were doing our initial um, deep dive into understanding our end user. And uh, we were working closely with uh, Professor Andrea gilmore Bykowski, who's in the School of Nursing, who is an expert in, in dementia care. And she really helped us understand that the words caregivers were using were quite different from the words that we were using and the words that are used by a lot of the clinical folks, especially when talking about Um, more challenging aspects of caregiving, such as communicating about behavioral symptoms. And when we wanted to provide some kind of connection to strategies for managing these challenging symptoms, we found that um, 
they weren't going to be using the search terms that we were creating because we were using the clinical terms. So that was causing a big problem. So what we did was we used our interviews and um, also um, did some kind of mining of uh, social media sources of uh, uh, where caregivers talked about these kinds of things. And we created a natural language processing based semantic dictionary so that caregivers can put in their own words the situation that they're, they're um, encountering in terms of behavioral symptoms. And then we try to link on the back end the clinical term so that they can learn the clinical term, which we're hoping will help communication with clinicians in, in, as it goes forward. And then also so we can connect them to kind of the evidence base of the strategies that are best for that symptom. That's an incredible process. And I see it in my clinic all the time where I'm trying to speak about something and I'm not reaching the patient or the caregiver. And it's really, we're talking about the same thing, but we're, the language that we use is so different um, that there could be misunderstanding. So I can see that part of this app being an amazing feature, um, clinically, of course, for me, for, for me in my clinic, but also on the receiving end to be a family member who's trying to communicate something to a healthcare provider mm -hmm. But and just not getting the the message across, and it's not because of lack of effort. It's it's just because of the misunderstanding. Right. Are you in the process of testing the app? And if so, could you can you tell us what that looks like um, and how you how you're seeing improvements made uh, based on this user experience? Yes, we have been uh, t developing, designing, and developing this app over a couple of years. The last couple of years. So I guess I'm, I'm hesitating a little bit because testing the app um, has happened, I feel, since the initial, um, the initial ideation of this app because that's kind of how we, as human factors engineers, do our design processes. We come up with ideas and we bring them back to end user, end user representatives, and we do this iterative process of design where we go from design, design to um, user input to redesign, and it's kind of cyclical like that. What we found is that, you know, I mentioned doing the interviews, that helped us identify the key functions of the app. Um, it helped us determine, um, it helped us determine how caregivers would interact with information and how they tried to seek information currently so that we can figure out how to design our app to best fit that. I think, um, one, one key piece of what we're doing is to really move away from a deficit focus and focus on those kind of the strengths and capabilities. And so that's what our app tries to do. Um, and then in terms of testing that, we bring the design back to them. So we initially had a prototype that was just made in um, PowerPoint um, at, at its very earliest and then went to a more high fidelity um, framing in a, in a different kind of software and then we brought that back to users and we simplified and, and many people spoke about the language we were using. So we changed the language many times and simplify, simplify, simplify everything. And so now um, we are working with a developer locally here in Madison and waiting for our um, testable prototype. And once that's completed, um, within the next few months, we'll be giving it to just a handful, just a few caregivers uh, to use for a couple of weeks and we'll ask them afterward about how that process went what were the barriers to use what did they enjoy about it um, and then we'll go through another iteration so this is quite a long process um, to get to a refined place yeah you know i'm glad you said that because one of my next questions was going to be oh when will this app become available to the community but it seems like you can't answer that question and then how would you know then that the app is ready for actual launch to the community? I don't know how to quite say how long it will be, but I do have a process planned based on what I know about um, user testing and my experience with bringing other products out, which is that I'll give it to a few people and I will make changes based on that. And then um, I'll also follow kind of the... Um, traditional uh, scientific method where I want to demonstrate that this is effective before I want to give it to a lot of people. Um, 
again, this whole idea that I want to give them something that's truly going to help and that I know is going to help and I can tell them without a doubt, this is going to improve outcomes for you and the, and the person you provide care for. And so after the initial testing, we'll do a randomized controlled trial where we give it to a large number of people and compare um, people using the app on, with people on a wait list for using the app. And we'll determine whether the app improves uh, outcomes related to the experience of caregiver burden and also related to the connectivity of the network. And I'm glad you explained that because while it seems like such a long process, it also ensures that this is truly going to be helpful to people and that it's been proven to be helpful to people. It, it does make me wonder if your lab then has been a part of other technology tools for people with dementia or their caregivers, or if you have other projects that you work on simultaneously along with this one. We do. We're a busy lab. We have lots of other projects <laughs> and uh, uh, lots of fun, good projects going on. Um, one of the things that we really seek to do also is more broadly influence technology design for these folks. And so we do a lot of work. So we do a lot of work understanding the strengths and capabilities of these folks so that we can make design recommendations for people who, other people who are designing technologies. And so that's one of our big projects is understanding caregiver information behavior so that we can provide design recommendations to people, all the many people who are working on information products for caregivers, Alzheimer's Association website, um, all the different brochures you see out there, anything information-based, we're trying to help um, design it to better fit how caregivers actually seek and interact with information. So that's one example. Um, another one coming down the pipeline is to use this user-centered design process to create a new IT-based intervention that's focused on helping caregivers um, manage medications for people with dementia. So this is a great area of need, and I've partnered with uh, Indiana University in this work. Um, we've only proposed it, so we're waiting to hear if we can do it, <laughs> if we get the grant funding. Um, but I feel really excited about the, that opportunity, um, especially because we've proposed to do a participatory design process, which means that we will have caregivers come together either in person or virtually, whatever is possible at that time, and they will actually be the designers of the product. Well, that sounds very creative and and well, could be very productive since these are the people you want to be helping directly. I think so. I really love this approach. It really democratizes design. And I think it's important to involve caregivers in this process, and they often aren't. And so for our listeners who are out there and they're looking for technology tools right now that they could assist a family member living with dementia are there certain key features or qualities that you feel like as consumers we should be looking to make sure a product has? Yeah, that's really tough because there are so many tools out there. And uh, there's tools that are specific to dementia care. And there's tools that are <laughs> um, useful for dementia care, but not specific to dementia care. And technologies are so broad. They can be anything from like a digital scale to you know, the, a digital assisted or, or a digital assistant, you know, the Alexa, um, a voice controlled digital assistant was the word I was looking for. So finding the right one can be really difficult, actually. Um, and so in terms of in terms of finding uh, good qualities, I think one of the things is what I mentioned, uh, if you can find something that's been rigorously tested or has demonstrated efficacy, so things that have come out of research, I think that can be really important to make sure that you're investing in a product that it has that will work or that it's likely to work. Um, I think there's also help out there for this. Um, so you can start with a need and try to find something that can fit that need, but enlist support to do this. So there's people at the Alzheimer's Association um, there's dementia care specialists in, um, in communities working with the uh, Aging and Disability Resource Centers. And uh, I've also found that the tech-savvy family member or neighbor 
can be really, really useful with navigating these and helping to find a good tool. Have you encountered any particular tools or programs for people with dementia, or their caregivers that you think are particularly helpful that maybe our listeners would want to just hear from you? Yeah, I have to say that what I've found from talking to lots of caregivers over the past couple of years, that some of the best tools are the things you already have. So the things that you're already familiar with, but that you are you can use for a different purpose. So things like Google um, Calendar, Google Calendar, you can use to share a calendar across all the different people who might be providing care. Um, using your email or a group text messaging um, on your phone to communicate across everyone so you don't have to send separate messages to each person. Or another one that's been popular recently is the um, the digital assistant, the voice control digital assistants like Alexa, where you can program it to help remind the person with dementia to take a medication or to drink water. Um, so these are things that we already have in our, a lot of us already have in our homes and are familiar with. And I think that's the best route to start because it's going to be easier to integrate into your life because it's already there. I do want to provide one quick example about Alexa, which I think highlights two points. So one is that um, my mom wanted to set it up so that it could, she could say, call Nicole in an emergency. And if she fell, for example, and it would just call me and didn't know how to do that. So we were able to set it up so that now if she falls, she can say, call Nicole, Alexa, call Nicole, and it will call me. Or she can also say, Alexa, call the emergency or the 911 and it will call them. But what we had to do was actually program that in. So some people actually believe that that's already built in, the calling 911, and it's not. You have to program it in. So sometimes you can have a little bit too much trust in these technologies. So you just have to make sure that you're 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 testing these for what the purposes are before you use them. That's really good advice. So we should really confirm that that something that we're familiar using can actually do what we need it to do. Right. Um, and I love the idea of repurposing because we are familiar with certain things because it fits our life. And isn't it better to just kind of modify something we're familiar with than to pick up a brand new app and or tool and try to learn that from the beginning? I think it can make it a lot easier to integrate and a lot more likely that you're going to stick with it because it's already part of your routine. Well, I guess to end then, you know, what have you learned about caregivers and caregiving in general during your work developing these important and helpful apps and tools? I love this question <laughs> because I just learned so much. I mean, my favorite part of my job is getting to go out into the community and talk to these folks about their lives. Um, I learned so much from every interaction. I think one of the coolest things is that um, each caregiver, and we talk about caregivers like it's this group of people, and I guess it is in a sense, but each person is so unique and has such a different um, life experience and, and types of needs. And I think that's really important to recognize as we're moving forward with developing technologies for this folks. I think the other thing is that we always talk about caregiving being challenging, but there's also a lot of positive aspects of caregiving that need to be recognized and highlighted. And the last thing is that I think caregivers are just true innovators. The things that I see them create and the ways that they've used technologies already without anyone creating anything specifically for them, just based out of need, is so impressive. I really agree with your last point, too. In my clinic, when I'm working with patients, so many of my recommendations come from other patients, right. family members that have just come up with these amazing ideas, uh, and then I've just tried to share them. So you're absolutely right. And, and I really think, you know, your work highlights the importance of participation and research participation because those participants that you're meeting with over and over again to improve this app are really making a difference in how this is going to help other people. So it's this, it feels like a very much a community collaborative project that you are leading here. I hope so. That's truly my goal. Well, thank you for what you're doing. 
uh, Nicole, and we do hope to have you back when this app is further along and you can tell us about what you found. Oh, I'd be thrilled to come tell you about it. Please subscribe to Dementia Matters on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, or wherever you get your podcasts. And rate us on your favorite podcast app. It helps other people find our show and lets us know how we're doing. Dementia Matters is brought to you by the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. The Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center combines academic, clinical, and research expertise from the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health and the Geriatric Research Education and Clinical Center of the William S. Middleton Memorial Veterans Hospital in Madison, Wisconsin. It receives funding from private university, state, and national sources, including a grant from the National Institutes of Health for Alzheimer's Disease Centers. This episode was produced by Rebecca Wazaleski and edited by Bashir Adin. Our musical jingle is Cases to Rest by Blue Dot Sessions. Check out our website at adrc.wisc.edu. That's adrc.wisc.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. If you have any questions or comments, email us at dementiamatters at medicine.wisc.edu. Thanks for listening.